talk's going to be given by Ali Zamaradi um, from Boston University, um, who wasn't able to make it here in person, but he's here virtually going to give his talk. Um, I see he's moving his mouse pointer. Um, so we're all in the room here. Ali, we're sorry you couldn't make it, but we're looking forward to your talk. So take it away. All right. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, it is really unfortunate that uh, I couldn't make it uh, uh, to the meeting and uh, I couldn't be present there physically and uh, meet all of you guys uh, in person. But um, I watched the meeting uh, through the uh, live stream online. Uh, so uh, I, I really look forward to contacting with you guys. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess you know, everybody uh, introduced themselves. Uh, so as for my introduction, uh, uh, I am a chemical engineer by training, uh, and uh, I am a computational systems biologist, uh, and uh, I'm uh, essentially using genome scan method models of metabolism to, to construct predictive uh, models of biological systems. Uh, in particular, microbial systems. Uh, in the past few years, uh, I have been uh, mostly developing computational tools uh, using these metabolic network models to uh, uh, essentially to model microbial uh, communities. And uh, for this thing, I really look forward to uh, to find innovative ways to to synergize uh, metabolic network models and uh, and trait-based modeling. Uh, so today I will be uh, uh, sharing with you some of our recent findings on how we can gain uh, a mechanistic uh, uh, understanding of interspecies interactions uh, in microbial communities by integrating the systems biology approach and a mathematical modeling approach. Uh, in particular, uh, I will be um, talking about how we incorporated organism-specific genomic and biochemical data uh, in the form of network models of metabolism uh, into uh, game theory, which is a general mathematical framework to study interactions among different agents in order to better understand uh, the evolution of uh, uh, metabolic dependencies in, uh, in microbial communities. So if we have uh, an, uh, the, an essential function that is uh, costly to, per to perform, uh, and is also leaky, meaning that uh, part of that function uh, is uh, inevitably leaked out of the cell and will be available to the broader community as a public benefit, then uh, a mutant strain may emerge, which has lost uh, its genes uh, for performing that uh, essential function. And uh, this may uh, create uh, a unidirectional dependency between these two strains, uh, where the Y type completely relies, uh, sorry, where the mutant strain completely relies on the Y type for the essential uh, function that it cannot perform on its own. Uh, so we'll see later on today that uh, if you have uh, more than one leaky traits, then uh, uh, more complex uh, dependencies such as cross uh, could also emerge. But the problem is that. Uh, it is not always uh, uh, easy or intuitive uh, to understand the fate of the community even for this very simple uh, unidirectional uh, uh, dependency or interaction. So let's look at one example together uh, from uh, literature. Uh, so when Saccharomyces cerevisiae goes on sucrose, it has to produce uh, a surface enzyme called invertase. Uh, uh, that hydrolyzes suc uh, sucrose into simpler sugars, such as glucose and fructose, uh, part of which is used by the cell, and part of which is, uh, uh, is leaked out of the cell. Uh, then uh, a mutant strain may emerge, which has lost uh, uh, its uh, inverted production genes, and this mutant strain would essentially act like a cheater, which does not contribute uh, uh, to the uh, sucrose hydrolysis, then we just rely on the available uh, glucose and fructose uh, in the community uh, uh, that is provided by the white type carbohydrates. Uh, 
So since this shear restraint does not incur the, uh, the metabolic and energetic costs of uh, inverted production and supercytolysis, one would naturally expect it to be able to uh, reproduce faster. And consistent with this uh, uh, intuition, initial experimental studies of this system show that uh, if such a shear restraint arises in a population of uh, white cooperators, uh, it would be able to eventually dominate the co-culture. So the graph that they have on the right uh, is uh, the essentially a cartoon showing how the fraction of cheaters and cooperators uh, change over time. Uh, but what happens at the end when cheaters dominate is that because there are no cooperators around uh, to provide uh, glucose and fruit juice, uh, the entire community collapses. And uh, this is what is called in the language of game theory, a prisoner's dilemma game. It simply means that cheating uh, uh, is not a good strategy here because it just doesn't have a happy end. A later study, however, by Jeff Gore showed that uh, uh, prisoner's dilemma is not the only outcome of this game. And uh, depending on the number of parameters, uh, the, we could have other outcomes as well, including the case where cooperators on it, in which case it is called a mutually beneficial or deadlock game or the case for cheaters and cooperators can stably coexist, in which case it is called a slow drift game. So the formal mathematical definition of these games um, really doesn't matter. All what you need to remember from this slide is that prisoner's dilemma means that cheaters dominate community collapses, mutually beneficial means that cooperators dominate, and the slow drift game means that cheaters and cooperators stably coexist. So they found in this study that whether we have either of these outcomes depends on the balance between the cost of performing sucrose hydrolysis by its own and the benefit of taking up glucose and fruit juice from the uh, environment. And this benefit would depend on how much of glucose and fruit juice is leaked out of the cell and how much is captured by producing fish. Uh, so if you have more than one leaky trace, then uh, analyzing these costs and balances could be even uh, more complicated. So the question that we ask and try to address uh, was whether we are able to quantitatively predict for each specific microbial system how these complex cost and benefit balances uh, would ultimately determine the fate uh, of the community. So it turns out that a suitable mathematical modeling framework to address this question is uh, game theory, which is a general mathematical framework to study interactions among different agents. Uh, it is pioneered by John Nash, uh, uh, who uh, introduced the concept of Nash equilibrium, for which he won a Nobel Prize in economics. Nash equilibrium is, uh, uh, describes an equilibrium state of the game where uh, no player has uh, any incentive to unilaterally change his current strategy because it won't be able to increase his fitness or, or payoff uh, by this change of a strategy. The game theory was initially used in the context of uh, economics uh, and political science, but it was later extended by uh, John Maynard Smith and others uh, to study the evolution of mixed populations in biology. And uh, game theory in the context of uh, biology is called evolutionary game theory. So the way evolutionary game theory works for modern microbial communities is as follows. We start by considering all possible pairwise or higher order interactions among all genotypes that we have in the community. So I just focused today on pairwise interactions and, and extension to high order interactions with the straightforward. In each pairwise interaction, we then estimate the, uh, the payoff or the fitness of uh, genotypes or species involved. For example, if a cheater yeast cell faces another cheater yeast cell, then uh, their fitness would be zero because neither of them can degrade sucrose and provide glucose and fructose. We can similarly estimate the payoff of a cooperator cell facing another cooperator cell, or the payoff of a cooperator facing a cheater. Once these payoffs were estimated, they can then be, uh, be uh, represented in the form of a symmetric matrix, which is called the payoff matrix of the game. Uh, for example, point one and point three, which are the fitnesses of uh, uh, cooperator and cheater cells when they face each other is shown in these cell of the matrix. So once the payoff matrix was constructed, there are a number of things that we can do. First, we can determine the Nash equilibrium of the system. And in this case, Nash equilibrium essentially represents the equilibrium state of interspecies interactions. And uh, uh, it essentially captures all those uh, complex costs and benefit balances in one unique metric. 
for example, in this carbon that I have shown here, cheater cheater is a natural equilibrium uh, of the system. Uh, another thing that you can do with uh, with this uh, estimated payoffs or the payoff matrix is to use them to uh, to model the evolution and dynamics uh, of the system. And um, at least in this uh, context, it means evolution dynamics means have the fraction of the frequency of uh, different genotypes or species in the community change over time. So if uh, 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 in the carbon that I have shown here, like I said, cheetah cheetah is a natural equilibrium. And if this is the only natural equilibrium, then evolution dynamics would show that cheetahs uh, dominate the culture. Uh, obviously, depending on the values of the payoffs, we could have other types of uh, natural equilibrium. For example, we can have cooperator cooperator, in which case evolution dynamics would show that cooperators dominate. Or we can have cheetah cooperator, in which case evolution dynamics would show that cheetahs and cooperators stably coexist. Uh, so it is worth noting that if I have more than one cell of the metrics uh, that are non-symmetric and uh, simultaneously satisfy the conditions of a natural equilibrium, then in that case, this is the evolution dynamics that uh, uh, could tell us which one of these natural equilibria would be evolutionarily stable or uh, serve as an evolutionary stable strategy. So despite many success uh, stories of uh, evolutionary game theory, uh, an important limitation uh, with this approach, uh, which can limit its uh, applicability uh, to a specific uh, microbial system, is that uh, systems is that uh, the payoffs are often estimated by using intuition, or otherwise we need to perform dedicated experiments for the specific system that we are working with. Uh, additionally, evolution dynamics, which is often modeled in evolutionary game theory by using replicator equation or equations like that, depend on these. Uh, uh, values uh, of the payoffs, uh, and therefore they cannot uh, incorporate organism-specific or system-specific features into their analysis. Uh, so to bypass this limitation, we decided to incorporate uh, the organism-specific data uh, uh, into evolution and game theory, and we did this by using genome-scale network models of metabolism. So the way these uh, genome-scale metabolic network models work is as follows. We start with the sequence and annotated genomes of the uh, organisms that we are interested in. And from there, we construct a genome scale metabolic network model, which is nothing but the list of all metabolic reactions encoded by the genome of that organism. So because this model is just a list of uh, uh, reactions, to be able to uh, make quantitative predictions about the cell phenotypes uh, or traits, uh, that we, uh, we need a mathematical model. Uh, so the most widely used of uh, such models is called price balance analysis that use uh, these metabolic networks uh, and, and a defined growth medium as the input, and they can predict uh, the growth of uh, that organism in that defined growth medium, the rates or fluxes of intracellular metabolic actions, metabolites that are possibly secreted out, and the secretion rates in that defined growth. Uh, these uh, models have been extended in the past few years to model interspecies interactions as well. Uh, so here uh, we start with uh, metabolic network models for the genotypes present in the community. And then uh, we can use extensions of this flux balance analysis tools uh, uh, to essentially make predictions about the growth of uh, the different organisms in the community in a defined growth medium. Again, uh, intracellular uh, 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 metabolic reaction rates, uh, metabolites that are possible exchange among community members and their secretion mm -hmm. rates. So there are many extensions of these methods to model dynamics of extracellular environments in homogeneous and heterogeneous environments uh, that uh, I would be happy to talk more about uh, in details uh, uh, later on today. Uh, so getting back to the, our problem, the way we incorporated this uh, metabolic network models into evolutionary game theory is as follows. We uh, start with the metabolic network models for the genotypes present in the community, and then we just use these uh, uh, FBA-based uh, computational tools to estimate the payoffs of microbial players in all possible pairwise or higher order interactions. So this means that by using this uh, approach, we are now able to uh, um, provide organism-specific and genomically and biochemically informed estimates estimates of the payoffs or fitnesses of uh, microbial players uh, at uh, high throughput and under any environmental condition or genetic background that we are interested in. Uh, 
uh, which is not possible. So once the payoff matrix was constructed, the rest is the same as before. We can either determine the natural equilibrium of the system or model evolutionary uh, dynamics. So uh, uh, as a proof of principle study, we first verify whether this mechanistic gain theory uh, or evolutionary gain theory model is able to uh, recapitulate the known outcomes of interspecies interactions uh, in the well-characterized uh, yeast supracytolysis system that they just talked about. Uh, so uh, to this end, I use a genome scale model of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that I have constructed before. And then uh, I determine the Nash uh, equilibrium interspecies interactions as a function of two important parameters. On the horizontal axis, we have the cost of supracytolysis, which we model here by changing the stoichiometric coefficient of uh, ATP in the supracytolysis interaction in the metabolic model. And on the vertical axis, we have the percentage of glucose and fructose that is captured by white type uh, uh, operator systems. So as you can see, we have been able to successfully recover the uh, three major types of outcomes observed experimentally, including prisoners' dilemma, mutually beneficial, and snowdrift gains. Uh, in particular, uh, you can see that prisoners' dilemma uh, occurs for, uh, uh, for high cuts of supracytolysis and low uh, capture efficiencies. Mutually beneficial gain occurs for uh, the opposite case of uh, 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 low cost of supercytolysis and higher capture efficiencies, and the snow drift game emerges for intermediate values between these two extremes. Uh, as a, an additional verification of the model, we also uh, modeled uh, another experiment where an external supply of glucose was provided in the growth medium. And uh, here it was observed that the cheaters are able to dominate the co-culture under a wider range of conditions. And the reason is that uh, cheater cells uh, are now less reliant on the white of cooperators for the availability of the glucose. So consistent with this experimental observation, as you can see from the graph on the right, uh, we have uh, uh, predicted that uh, uh, when uh, addition of external glucose is simulated yeah. by using these metabolic models, the entire snow drift game region and even part of the mutually beneficial game region that we have uh, on the graph on the left uh, has now been occupied by prisoners of the lima in the graph that we have on the right. Uh, we also perform evolution dynamic simulations to gain insight into fraction of frequency of cheaters and cooperators. Uh, so I'm not uh, going to those details. Uh, the manuscript uh, preprint is available on BioArchive, and I guess uh, it was posted on the workshop resources as well that you can check out for more details. So. Moving forward, uh, we next use this uh, mechanistic uh, evolutionary gain theory model in predictive mode to construct uh, the global map of ecological interactions that are mediated by the exchange of amino acids uh, in E. coli. Uh, there is indeed evidence that E. coli in natural microbial communities uh, leaks out different amino acids. And here for this analysis, just to make it more complicated and interesting, we focus on two leaky traits. So the genotypes that we have, the possible genotypes that we have uh, uh, in the community uh, includes uh, a white type of strain, white type of E. coli strain that secretes out or leaks out two different amino acids uh, shown here by a triangle and circle. We can have two single mutant strains. Each has lost the genes for one of the amino acids, but can this synthesize and leak out the other amino acid. And uh, finally, double mutant strain, which has lost the genes for both of these two amino acids. So given these four genotypes, now there are uh, different possibilities for interspecies interaction. For example, we can have uh, a unidirectional dependency of the double mutant strain uh, on the Y type for the two amino acids that cannot synthesize. Or we can have cross-feeding between two complementary single mutant strains. Or we can have even more complex cases like this, where the double mutant strain coexists with cross-feeders uh, and essentially relies on the amino acids that are exchanged among the cross So the question that we asked here uh, was that even uh, those four genotypes on the top, which one of uh, these interspecies interactions uh, would emerge as the, as the equilibrium uh, of interspecies interactions? Uh, so to address this, we used the latest genome scale uh, metabolic network model of E. coli, and we performed this analysis for all possible cases of amino acids uh, and across different leakiness levels for each uh, uh, amino acid. So the color map here in this slide essentially represents the identified natural equilibrium for interspecies interactions across all amino acid pairs. 
and uh, each rectangle um, uh, uh, on the map, uh, which is shown uh, on the uh, on the left, uh, is essentially the identified Nash equilibrium for a given a specific amino acid. So let's focus on one of these pairs uh, to see um, what's going on there. So here we have lysine and isoleucine amino acid pair on the horizontal axis. We have the percentage of lysine that is leaked out of the cell. On the vertical axis, we have uh, the same thing for isoleucine. And different colored regions uh, correspond to different uh, natural equilibrium of interspecies interactions that we found uh, across different deepness levels. We have all sorts of different equilibria. For example, we have a unidirectional dependency between the white part and the single mutant strain. We have associations that are all non viable and uh, are essentially uh, the same or very much similar like prisoner's dilemma. Remember that prisoner's dilemma was cheater cheater, which was non viable. Uh, for example, here, uh, an association between the double mutant strain and lice single mutant strain is a non-viable association because neither of them can, can provide uh, or synthesize isolation. Or we have uh, more uh, complex cases such as uh, both the unidirectional and uh, the non-viable and so on. Uh, 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 so I need to uh, mention here that uh, for the given leakiness level for both amino acids, it is possible for more than one association to emerge as a natural equilibrium. Uh, but now let's focus on a particular region in this graph, the green region, which I have shown with that triangle with white borders uh, on that graph. So this region characterizes the leakiness levels for lysine and isoleucine for which the white fiber strain can also sustain growth. Uh, this means that uh, the, any leakiness level uh, outside this region will make the white fiber strain to go extinct because it would be too much of a burden to leak those ramnets at those levels. And this is important because um, uh, we would naturally expect the leakiness level of uh, lysine and isoleucine by white, uh, by, uh, white high E. coli in natural microbial communities to indeed lie in this region because otherwise it will go extinct. But uh, what is interesting about this region is that we found that uh, both a unidirectional uh, dependency between the double mutant and white type, and also uh, a cross fitting association between complementary single mutant strains uh, simultaneously emerge uh, as the Nash equilibrium in this region. Uh, even more interestingly, we found that this is not the case only for lysine and isoleucine, but also we observed this pattern for about 75% uh, of the amino acid phase. It might be difficult for you to to find those green regions in this uh, in this map, but if you just trust me, we do see it for, for about 75 percent of the amino acid use. So this means that despite the diverse nature of the amino acids that are exchanged, uh, we are still able to uh, identify some general patterns there, which is good. Uh, there are however 20 over 25 percent of the pairs that do not conform to this general pattern, and these are some of the details of, uh, that. Uh, uh, features uh, that could be captured only by uh, incorporating these mechanistic details uh, that uh, uh, are afforded by metabolic models into this analysis. Uh, so for this 25% of uh, other amino acid phase that do not conform to that general pattern, uh, that region of sustainable leakiness level that I have shown again here by that uh, triangle with white borders uh, is uh, either partitioned to a number of uh, sub-regions, each corresponding to a different equilibrium, or we have extreme cases like this where that entire region is completely uh, occupied by a unidirectional dependency, but not by cross-fitting that we had in the general pattern. Or extreme cases like this where that entire region has been completely occupied by a cross-fitting dependency, but not by a unidirectional uh, dependency. So let's focus in one of these extreme cases, the last one in particular, because there are a number of uh, interesting lessons that we can learn from them. So this is for glycine and trionine amino acid pairs, uh, where uh, only a cross-fitting between the trionine and, uh, and uh, glycine single mutant strain uh, emerge, emerge as a, emerges as a Nash equilibrium in the region of sustainable leakiness levels. Uh, but uh, a unidirectional dependency between the double mutant and Wi-Fi does not emerge uh, in contrast to what we had in the general pattern. So our investigation is to find out why this is the case actually revealed um, uh, a counterintuitive fact. So here's what's going on here. We naturally expect the fitness of the uh, Y type, the fitness of the double mutant strains when facing the Y type to be higher than the fitness of any of the single mutant strains when facing the Y type. And the reason is that the double mutant strain does not incur the production cost of two amino acids, whereas the single mutant strains, they still have to uh, synthesize uh, one of the amino acids. 
However, by inspection of the payoff matrices, we found that uh, contrary to these expectation, the fitness of the uh, double mutant strain when placing the white type is lower than the fitness of trion in single mutant strain when placing the white type. So further investigations using uh, the, uh, the metabolic networks and uh, flux balance analysis tools revealed that the reason for this observation is that uh, the, a number of precursors, in particular serine, uh, are produced at significantly lower levels in the network of the double mutant strain compared to the network of trion in single mutant strain. And this explains why a unidirectional dependency between the white type and the double mutant does not emerge as a national equilibrium in this region. So this is an example of what is formally called epistasis. Uh, in, simpler, in simple words, it means that the phenotype of a double mutant strain is not the simple uh, product of the phenotypes of two single mutant strains. And this example just highlights how these, uh, how interactions among uh, intracellular metabolic pathways underlying the exchange amino acids can really determine the type of interspecies interactions at, uh, at equilibrium. Uh, and uh, these features, again, could not be captured by phenomenological models. So now let's uh, get back to the general pattern that we had for the uh, for 75 percent of amino acids, where both a unidirectional dependency and cross-fitting simultaneously emerge as a natural equilibrium. So this raises the question of uh, under what conditions uh, one versus the other uh, evolutionary uh, emerges. Particularly here, we are interested uh, to know under what conditions cross-fitting emerges evolutionary, because that's kind of an open question in, uh, in evolutionary biology. So it turned out that the answer to this question is that it very much depends on the initial frequency uh, of these four genotypes in the community. Uh, so to explore this further, we performed a number of targeted invasion experiments in silico uh, by using replicator equation, uh, uh, where we started from different initial frequencies uh, for, these, uh, for these four genotypes. And each simulation that we did had a direct biological interpretation. So I'm not going into all details of that. Uh, you can find the details again uh, in the manuscript on BioArchive. Uh, I just tell you the end result. Uh, so we found that uh, if the double mutant strain is present initially in the community, then in that case, cross-feeders do not have any chance to emerge. Here's an example of such a scenario. So if the two single mutant strains and the double mutant strain simultaneously emerge from Y type, and they invade a resident population of the Y type, so F here represents the initial frequency of these four genotypes. Then in that case, uh, we found that the double mutant drives to extinction, uh, drives the cross feeders to extinction, but uh, it can stably coexist with Y type. Uh, on the other hand, we found that if the double mutant strain is not present initially in the community, and if it does not emerges, uh, if, if it does not emerge from the Y type uh, 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 in the first uh, stage, then there is a chance for cross feeders to emerge. And here's an example of such a scenario. Uh, assume that in the first step, uh, only the two single mutant strains emerge from the Y type and invade the population of Y type. Again, F here represents the initial frequency. So we found that at equilibrium, these cross feeders can stably coexist with the Y type. But in the later stage, after reaching that first equilibrium, the cross feeders or the single mutant strains can lose uh, their genes for the remaining amino acid that they can synthesize and be converted to a double mutant strain. We found that in this case, the double mutant strain is not able to invade a resident population of the white type and cross feeders, even in a homogeneous environment. And there are already experimental evidence uh, uh, to support that. So I'm currently, uh, there are a number of other uh, interesting scenarios that we explored uh, uh, by using these simulations. And uh, I have just started testing some of this, uh, uh, these predictions in the lab. Uh, so uh, just uh, to, uh, to quickly uh, recap what I uh, talked about today, uh, I, uh, I told you how uh, we incorporated organism-specific genomic and biochemical data into evolutionary game theory. And uh, then uh, we used this mechanistic game theory approach to construct the, uh, the global map of ecological interactions in populations of E. coli that uh, lead to different amino acids. And uh, the take home message really from this analysis was that uh, the, uh, taking into account for these mechanistic details uh, that are captured by metabolic networks uh, is really important because uh, the, these intracellular metabolic circuits can really shape the type of interspecies interactions uh, in microbial communities that, uh, that emerge at the equilibrium.
Uh, so with that, I would like to thank, uh, well, my, obviously my advisor, Daniel Sekri, and, uh, uh, and others, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. It's a very simple question. W what's the next step of your approach? What do you want to do with that after that? Um, can you say the question again so I can hear you? So very simple question. What's the next step of your approach? What's your next goal with that? With the, the uh, sure. So the next step is that, okay, so there are a number of directions that you can go. The first thing is that, you know, all those simulations are performing on the genius of right? Uh, so the next step is to, um, is to take into account for the spatial heterogeneity uh, of the environment and see how the spatial structures uh, would affect this equilibrium. The other thing is that uh, for this invasion experiment that I just talked about in the last part of my talk, uh, so we use replicator equation, we just take into account the changes in the frequency of the species, but there is evidence uh, in literature uh, showing that uh, the, not just frequency, but also the abundance of the species would also uh, affect the equilibria. This is called uh, eco-evolutionary dynamics. I guess, you know, a, a paper from Alvaro Sanchez uh, uh, in class biology uh, really uh, has explored that really, uh, in a really beautiful way. So the next step is to take into account for the, for the abundance of the species as well. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thanks so much.